recently. But it's probable all our ancestors were rather like that. And when people started settling, um, they, they gathered together um, for ceremonies. And Stonehenge, for example, and all the other great stone circles were not in the middle of cities. They weren't temples in the middle of cities. They were gathering places where people gathered for ceremonies, probably at solstices and other notable <coughs> philanthropical moments. Um, and going to those for the festivals and then going back again was a kind of pilgrimage. <coughs> and this idea of going to holy places, going to places which are of particular significance, with particular stories, um, is very deep in the culture of all cultures, which is why when settled civilizations began, um, they all had pilgrimages. And that's why we find pilgrimage in every tradition around the world, or practically everyone. Um, when I was living in India, which I lived in for seven years, uh, that's when I first got interested in pilgrimage, because all over India you see pilgrims walking along the roads, sometimes travelling in buses and trains, but there are a lot doing it on foot. And they're going to the source of the Ganges, to holy caves, to temples, to uh, Kanyakumari, to the southernmost tip of India. There's many kinds of holy place in India. And pilgrimage is still a huge, vital tradition there. Um, and I was really impressed by this. I went on some pilgrimages in India myself. Um, and when I got back to England, I thought, what a shame we don't have them here. And then I realised, well, actually, we've got all these holy places. We used to have pilgrimages in England. And I got interested in rediscovering it here in our own country. Um, of course, we, England was full of, and so the whole of Britain was full of pilgrimages uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and there were many pilgrimage sites, Canterbury, Walsingham, Hales Abbey, I mean, there were lots and lots, St. Ethelfrieda's Shrine of Ely. The whole country was full of pilgrimage routes. But they were all suppressed in 1538 with, by Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell uh, in the injunction against pilgrimage. And since the Reformation here also involved destroying monasteries, which were the infrastructure for pilgrimage, it was more or less killed off in England, as it was in other Protestant countries. Um, it didn't really begin to revive in England until the 19th century. A few cathedrals began to start pilgrimage routes on a very small scale. And people started going on pilgrimages to the Holy Land. That's really what got the ball rolling here. Um, uh, uh, an enterprising travel agent called Thomas Cook hit on the idea of uh, uh, organising pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Um, and uh, then uh, the Prince of Wales went on one and it became quite fashionable. It wasn't possible uh, until the 19th century because it was too politically unstable in, in Palestine to go on these pilgrimages. Um, anyway, the, the, I think that one of the reasons that the, the English, uh, you know, they were, having been deprived of pilgrimage, I think one of the reasons the English invented tourism was really to replace pilgrimage. I mean, the, the, having been suppressed in England, within a few generations, the English had invented tourism, um, <laughs> which means going to holy places, uh, but now pretending that you're a secular, modern, uh, enlightened, rational person. So when you get to the holy place, you have to pretend you're primarily interested in art history, um, uh, rather than in the qualities of the place itself. And so I, I think of pilgrimage as, as uh, tourism as secularised pilgrimage, or as Will Parsons, one of the founders of the British Pilgrimage Trust, more accurately put it, frustrated pilgrimage. Because when you get to the holy place, you can't kneel down and say a prayer or light a candle if you're a tourist, because you've got to pretend you've risen above all that, religions for superstitious people, uneducated, deluded, etc., whereas you, you're just appreciating the beauty of the buildings and the history. Um, so um, I think one of the big paradigm shifts that going, is, that's going on at the moment is this shift back from tourism to pilgrimage, which is so much more satisfying and, uh, and so much more fun, really, than going as a tourist. Um, and here in Britain, the revival of pilgrimage uh, 
really, I, I think this recent revival, as Sir Simon Jenkins said, is really uh, follows on from the great revival at Santiago de Compostela, which has really been the iconic route for in, in, in the 20th century of <coughs> pilgrimage in Europe. And has led to an upsurge of pilgrimage all over Europe including in Scandinavia, where it was suppressed as it was in England, the great pilgrimage route from Oslo to Trondheim Cathedral in Norway is now an enormously popular route for Scandinavians and Germans particularly. Um, but again, it, that was a recent revival. It's in the last few decades that that's been revived. So what we're seeing is part of a historic change in attitude. And I think it's... Um, it's really exciting that the British Pilgrimage Trust is now doing so much, not only to open up the old way um, and several other long distance routes, but more recently in the last few years, um, creating or developing or rediscovering um, one day pilgrimage routes to all 42 English cathedrals um, and other cathedrals in Britain as well. And these one day routes are ones that I'm personally very keen on because um, as some of you know, um, I have a, a godson who, when he was 14, I couldn't think what to give him for his birthday. I stopped giving stuff, <coughs> because most people have got too much stuff. So I give experiences, and I thought, what experience can I give a 14-year-old boy? Um, and then I thought, OK, I'll, I was, I, Guy and I were working on pilgrimages at the time. I said, off him a pilgrimage. So I said to him, OK, for your birthday, off you a pilgrimage. We take the train to a little village near Canterbury. We walk <coughs> six or seven miles, the last part of the uh, route, into Canterbury. We go to the Black Prince's Well, which is a healing well, an ancient well. Uh, we have a picnic on the way. We get to Canterbury Cathedral. We light candles at the shrine. We have a cream tea. Then we go to Coral Evensong. Uh, then we go home on the high-speed train. I said, would you like to do that? And without hesitation, I said, yes. And it was the most blissful day. And then the next year, we did, uh, we, uh, we did Ely, and then Cambridge, uh, then Lincoln, uh, then um, Winchester, and Chichester. Um, and so a different cathedral every year. Um, uh, with a one-day route. And now there are one-day routes to all our cathedrals, and I strongly recommend it. The, the country is full of underemployed godparents. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, this is a, a really good thing to do with, with godchildren, because it's, it's really fun, you really get to know them, it's good exercise uh, for both. I must admit, with my... Um, one thing I hadn't thought of with my 14-year-old godson, our first pilgrimage was, you know, uh, when we were a couple of miles from Canterbury, he was visibly flagging. <laughs> I'd assumed all 14-year-olds would be able to walk that kind of distance. It turned out not to be true. I had to revive him with cups of tea quite frequently along the last part of the route. Um, so, uh, anyway, it's a, a great thing to do with... with um, um, God children. I also think it's a great thing to do for things like wedding anniversaries and birthdays. My wife and I try and do a pilgrimage to a cathedral um, on our wedding anniversary and go to Coral Evensong. And we also afterwards ask the dean or whoever's officiating for a blessing. And they're always very, gra they're very gracious about it and they, they, they do it really well. So again, I'd recommend this as a wedding anniversary uh, or a birthday. <laughs> activity. Oh, one yeah. minute, can I just bring in a new idea? I haven't told you this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When he says that, I, I now I've learned, oh no, what, 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 like, what am I going to have to do? Like, because they're always, yeah, they're really well, no, The thing is, there's so many possibilities for pilgrimage. <laughs> uh, I happened to be invited to a guest night at an Oxford College on Sunday, just two days ago, um, uh, three days ago. Um, and one of my th things, I'm always trying to think of new ideas for the National Health Service as well. And one of my uh, a standard conversational lines is where I say, if I ran the NHS, I'd do this. But at this 
Oxford dinner. I was sitting opposite a distinguished looking gentleman, and when I found out what she did, he does write about me. He's chairman of NHS England. So, um, so this was an amazing opportunity. So, um, uh, I ran past from an idea that popped into my mind. I mean, several I'd already thought out for what if I ran the NHS. <laughs> social prescribing. Yeah. What they're trying to do is have social prescriptions. So instead of have people being given pills, uh, psychiatrists and doctors prescribe social prescribing activities. And I think pilgrimage would be a wonderful thing for social prescribing. Um, and, uh, you know, because yeah. it, it costs the NHS very little, it would have measurable and beneficial effects for a lot of people. Great funding for the British Pilgrimage Trust. Yes, so great be. funding, uh, <laughs> yeah. a partnership agreement with the British Pilgrimage <laughs> Trust. Um, and, you know, a bit like in the Middle Ages, you go and see your confessor and they prescribe a pilgrimage. I mean, now you go and see a psychiatrist and they prescribe a pilgrimage. It's, it has a long tradition behind it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we're taking the grim pill, pill grim, but it doesn't really work. But, um, but yeah, like, um, uh, but it would it make, make sense. And, and I guess you could, have, you could also have uh, certain moments during your journey, you could have a therapist walking with you or there were sort of many ways of, doing it. I yes, guess. you could have it as a guy, as a walk with a group of people. Yeah, we could do yes. that. Um, we were actually going to do one with the um, Mind Mental, mm. the Mental Health Charity, and mm. work, actually walk with people who had that. And, and then you, because I'm not trained, we'd walk with people who were, are trained in dealing with the things that come up. Mm. And um, so that would be, there are, there are quite a different ways of doing it. Mm. Um, you have some other unusual ideas, and that's what generally we're trying to access with this um so um what about the the, the, what, the lightning the uh, oh well the lightning thing this is a uh, this is perhaps slightly peripheral to our main interest but um the um uh, holy places if you think about it are usually vertical standing stones obelisks spires towers um uh, minarets and what they do is symbolise the connection of the holy place, which is the connection of heaven and earth at the holy place. Uh, because holy places are places that relate us to the earth beneath and the sky above, uh, with all those symbolic meanings that are associated with them as well. But it's, they're literally linking heaven and earth. And if you think about the dynamics of lightning, which is the most dramatic way in which the heavens interact with the earth, um, lightning strikes tall buildings or tall, th tall trees or t mountain tops. The taller it is, the more it attracts the lightning. And the lightning is actually attracted to tall places. It funnels towards them. And um, when you install lightning <coughs> conductors, it makes them even more attractive because of an easier path into the earth. So our churches, cathedrals, and, 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 and uh, sacred buildings were the tallest buildings in the Middle Ages, and still in many towns and villages they still are. And so they're the principal conduit of lightning into the earth. So they funnel lightning into the earth in that holy place, and when it gets to the ground through the lightning conductor, it fans out from, out from that holy place. So it's literally the centre, uh, the holy centre, in a very literal, physical way. Um, I discovered that uh, when, I, when I asked people who run churches, you know, how often does lightning strike your church, none of them had a clue. Uh, they hadn't even thought about it at all. But I discovered that in France there's a company called LPS, Lightning Protection Systems in English, um, which makes lightning strike counters, which are small devices about that big that fit over the lightning conductor. They clamp onto the lightning conductor. Um, and Every time there's a lightning strike, there's a digital thing, it clicks up one. Uh, they don't need batteries because they use the million volts <laughs> <laughs> of the lightning conductor uh, to power them. So, these, so I sent off for some, um, three of them I, as a pilot scheme. And I had, it took weeks to get them through Heathrow because, uh, because of Brexit, they had to go through some customs. <laughs> lightning strike counters weren't on any list. <laughs> um, anyway, they've now been installed on the three, first in, in a, 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 a Fort Constantine in Staffordshire, which is village church with the spire, Christ Church Hampstead, which is at the top of the hill, uh, the highest mm. part of London with a big spire, and Newark on Trent Parish Church, my hometown. 
in Nottinghamshire. Unfortunately, we haven't had any lightning strikes <laughs> in the school of the counter. But I, Guy and I gave a talk at the, Brit the British Cathedral's uh, conference a few months ago, and we mentioned the lightning strike counters uh, idea to the cathedral deans assembled. And um, some of them really loved the idea. I was sitting at the dinner next to the Dean of Durham, and I said to him, you know, how many lightning conductors do your cathedral have? And he said, seven. And then he enumerated exactly where they were. He really knew where they were. Uh, this, of course, uh, wasn't totally good news because they cost £200 each, and if the cathedral has seven, that's £1,400. So uh, it was a bit beyond our budget. But on the way back, Guy's very good at networking, and we were sitting, um, we were sitting in the train uh, next to the chap whose organisation was sponsoring the whole cathedral's conference. It, it's a commercial company that does investment for cathedrals, and he's always trying to meet cathedral treasurers so they can put all their money in their fund. And so um, uh, he loved the idea of, of, of the lightning conducts on all the cathedrals, uh, so we could actually monitor which one had most lightning strikes and which tower had more than the others. So he said, how much would it cost? So we did some rapid sums, and it came to about £10,000. He said, we'll pay for it. <laughs> so uh, this is just one idea on the horizon. We're, we, the pilot scheme uh, is still going on. I think we need to have a few lightning strikes before we can have proof. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I suppose another one we're, we're looking at is... Um, because you've got sanctuary, and at the moment it's being sanctuary, the sanctuary network, which we, is a low-cost accommodation network all over Britain. We've got four routes, <coughs> about 60, 65 sanctuaries now, £10 a night, and you can get, as of yesterday, you can now get free information on, on them. So you can, <coughs> around, you can travel around. But it, at the moment it's slightly being presented as a practical solution to a problem, which is how do you pay for to, to sleep the night? Um, when you're on pilgrimage, because for a lot of people it's, it's prohibitive. But um, actually there's another way of, of adding a oh, yes. sort of selling point to sleeping in a, in a holy place. That's the setup. yeah. Well, yes, um, dream incubation is what Guy's referring to. As some of you may know, it's a very ancient practice. People sleep in holy places in order to have a healing or an inspiring dream. The biblical example, the classic biblical example, is King Solomon. Soon after he became sing, king, this is in the book of Kings, he went to the high place, the shrine, the pre-Jewish shrine of Gibeon, made offerings on the altar, and then slept in that place. And sure enough, God appeared to him in his dream and said, my son Solomon, what would you ask of me? And he said, give me an understanding heart. And God then says, well, since you asked for that and not for wealth or power, I give you an understanding heart and wealth and power. And, and the wisdom of Solomon is rooted in a healing dream at a holy place. In ancient Greece, at the temple of Aesculapius at Epidaurus, near the altar, there's a whole series of sleeping chambers where people would sleep in the temple for healing dreams. I got interested in this when I was living in India. I'd never heard of dream incubation at that time. But some Muslim friends of mine took me to a Sufi shrine near Hyderabad, uh, where uh, the saints buried in the shrine. And round the shrine, there were all these little groups of people camping for the night, sleeping in the courtyard, uh, families that had brought some ill member of the family to sleep there near the shrine. And the Sufi saint appeared to many of them in their dreams, and many of them were cured through these healing dreams. So I actually saw this happening in a Sufi context in India. Um, it happens in churches in the Eastern Orthodox Church, churches of Cosmo and Damien, Saints Cosmo and Damien. It's a long tradition in Eastern Orthodoxy. It happens in Hindu temples in Bengal and elsewhere. So we have a very ancient tradition here. Uh, well. Guy and I, uh, we thought we'd better practice, well, if we were going to do this, we'd better try it out. So with uh, my friend Mark Vernon and his friend, the vicar of St. Giles Camberwell, we actually tried it out at St. Giles Camberwell. We said Compline beforehand, evening prayers. And it was very lovely sleeping in the church. It wasn't a great success in terms of the actual dreams, because I, I don't remember my dreams very well. <laughs> uh, so I can't claim to have had a greatly inspiring dream in the process. But um, we've now made friends with a young woman 
uh, who is leading dream incubation workshops. And the first British Pilgrimage Trust dream incubation event happened last week in Hastings. Um, so this is, uh, now we've got sanctuary churches, and Guy told me that for the first time a cathedral, Hereford, has agreed for people to sleep in the cathedral. Um, this is now a possibility that part of pilgrimage can be dream incubation, sleeping in holy places. Um, and slightly akin to this is, is much simpler, of course, is, is lying on the floor, which already Sir Simon Jenkins mentioned. Um, uh, that it's the very best way to see the vaulting of churches and cathedrals lying on the floor. And, you know, you hear, you know, when you look up, uh, you've got the crane in your neck, and some cathedrals have little glass t- mirrors on tables. You look down to see what's above you. But the best way is to lie on the floor. And for several years, I and others have been pioneering this by, um, including with my godson on our pilgrimages. He always looks slightly embarrassed when I suggest you. <laughs> 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 um, um, have we got time to say more? A few couple of minutes. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, so we were trying out lying on the floor, but we had to do it surreptitiously because. You know, I didn't particularly want people to come rushing over with defibrillators. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we thought we'd better try and normalise this. And again, guys' networking capacities are enormous. And at the English Cathedrals Conference, the previous one, he gave a workshop and mentioned lying on the floor uh, to all these deans and people. And then a few weeks later, you know, two or three months later, Lincoln Cathedral started something called Sacred Space, where you go at 7.30 in the evening. It's quite wonderful, I've been to it. Uh, uh, you go at 7.30 in the evening, no service, you've got an hour and a half, you're just in the space. And you can, they have activities if you want an activity, but mostly it's just a way to be in the space. And when Guy went, the dean was handing out yoga mats to people as they went in so they could lie on the floor. So we, this is now becoming normalised in our cathedrals. And uh, I now ask vergers and so on, I say, you know, I'd like to lie on the floor, I'm not going to have a heart attack or anything. I did it at Wells recently, and, and it's a wonderful cathedral to do it in, both the chapter house and the, uh, and the, um, the chapel behind the high altar, the lady chapel area. It's an um, absolutely wonderful experience doing that. So anyway, um, there, there, there are all sorts of possibilities associated with pilgrimage, and these are just some. And I, I'd, I'd also like to say that um, although you've talked a lot about built sacred heritage like churches and cathedrals, mm. Rupert's a botanist, a biologist, and still publishing mm. in top journals, even, you know, after 60 years of, of working in it. And... Um, and so you have a love of plants and nature that um, is very amazing to be around. And um, we walk on Hampstead Heath, and you know, you, it's not you're not just into cathedrals. You have this deep connection oh, with no, nature as well. Oh no, I love to walk. I yeah. mean, I walk any, I mean, I walk every day anyway. But um, so, I, for me, pilgrimage is definitely about walking through the countryside. It's a very, very important part of it. Um, no, I think that's what's so good about it. It has everything. It connects you with the natural world. It connects you with history. It connects you with these holy places. Um, and it's something that has, here in, it's really exciting to do it here in Britain at the moment because it's like rediscovering something. If, if everyone had been doing it forever, uh, it would probably feel a bit tired and old. But right now, it has, well, it, it's wonderful to be doing it now because it has this really exciting quality about it, something new and fresh, even though it's archaic and ancient as a practice. Well, I feel this about so many things about the, uh, our traditions. I, for example, I think there's never been a better time to pray to saints and angels than, than today because most of them are grossly underemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Many fortunate features about the modern world. <laughs> a, a, a very good time to be embarking on pilgrimage. Mm. Well, thank you. <laughs>